Hello, my friends. We are back. This is your host, Kurt Willems, and I wanted to just share a few things that are going on. First of all, I'm really excited about today's interview. It's with Professor Valerie Rempel, who is a former professor of mine, someone I consider a friend. I went to church with her for a season and someone I really look up to. I had a great time in classes with her and in uh, more recent times at events and various other things. So I'm so excited about this interview. It's about the problem of evil. And because I wrote a book that has some themes tying to the problem of evil, it makes me just that much more excited to introduce this content to you. She is the dean at Fresno Pacific Biblical Seminary and the vice president of Fresno Pacific University, which is, of course, where I got my Master of Divinity. So super excited about that. The next thing I want to share with you, of course, is it is a new year. And with the new year here, we have an amazing opportunity to step in well. So I have tons of episodes that are in the hopper that are going to be releasing during the next couple of months, different kinds of interviews from various perspectives. I'm really excited about it. Uh, We'll have one with Dennis Edwards, Christiana Peterson on death and um, themes around death and formation. I mean, super fascinating. Sean Palmer is another one, John Mark Comer, and, and several others that I'm really, really excited about. Those were the ones that come to mind right away. So with that said, a great season of podcasts ahead. I'll have my own content coming through in the middle of that as well. Last thing I want to say is my book, Echoing Hope, How the Humanity of Jesus Redeems Our Pain, is coming out March 16th. So if you have supported this podcast, if you've supported my work in writing through Theology Curator, I would be absolutely honored if you would pre-order the book. You can go to echoinghope.com. That's echoinghope.com. And when you get the book, of course, there's a forward from Scott McKnight and afterward from Brian Zond. And a ton of people have come alongside and written some beautiful endorsements for it, which I'm just thrilled and honored. And honestly, this is my first book, so I'm just like kind of still in shock about the kindness of other Christian authors about this project. So I hope it will be helpful in your own journey, and I hope you'll check it out. With that said, let's jump into the show and into this really, really great interview with a really great human being, Dr. Professor Valerie Rempel. Welcome to Theology Curator, a podcast hosted by Kurt Willems and available online at theologycurator.com. Each episode looks at a theological, formational, or cultural theme. We might dig into the life and letters of a radical Jewish teacher named Paul, converse about a pressing contemporary issue, reflect on the nature of following Jesus today, or even attempt to remedy doom and gloom preaching with a good old-fashioned dose of hope. This show is an invitation to build bridges between the first century world of the earliest Christ followers into the 21st century reality we now inhabit. The Jesus we excavate from the rubble of tradition might just surprise us all. I want to welcome you back to the podcast. This is Kurt Willems, and I have a real, a real awesome, awesome opportunity today. I get to talk with Professor Valerie Rempel, who was one of my professors in seminary and um, has a whole a whole list of titles, Vice President of Fresno Pacific University, Dean of Seminary, um, of course, Associate Professor and the J.B. T- Taves Chair of History and Theology. Take a breath, Kurt. Welcome, Valerie. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Kurt. I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, Well, I uh, was telling you offline here that um, it's always really a treat for me when I get to interview people from my life. And, um, you know, I don't always uh, do that, but it's kind of been, yeah, it's been easier and easier, I feel like, now that we're kind of not just isolated to the Paul stuff all the time. And today we're going to be talking specifically about a book you wrote called Why Do We Suffer and Where Is God When We Do? It's part of the Small Books of Radical Faith, the Jesus Way series. And, you know, we've had uh, conversations about the Trinity based on this series and what is the Bible. And so 
Um, your installment is definitely a welcome one. So welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm delighted. Um, I was pleased to have the invitation to participate in the series. And of course, they are indeed very little books. Um, but I, I have a hope that they become accessible and that people find them really interesting jumping off places for their own deepening understanding of the kinds of theological issues that the, that the books are devoted with. And that it encourages people to think about what it means to be a Jesus follower. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and my impression so far from the ones I've read is they, they definitely do that, do that quite well. And that includes yours. Um, you know, when I was writing my book, I wrote a book on pain and, you know, so mm -hmm. your book came out right at the tail end of me finishing my draft. And I, I said, I've got to make sure I get that. And um, so I actually got it on Kindle because I could get it quicker. And I, have, I was looking back through my Kindle quotes. I was like, wow, I marked up quite a bit of this little book. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a good little it's a good little book in that way. And, you know, we'll, we'll get into the book here in a moment. But for folks who don't know you and your work. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to just maybe catch them up. How did how did you become a professor who devotes your time to studying Bible-y things? I mean, this is a very niche profession <laughs> and not very many go down that it road. It's, it's very <laughs> niche and it's such a good niche. But, um, you know, in short, tell us about your journey towards academics and some of the passions you have for, you know, as a Christian who studies and teaches sure. in these areas. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So your question prompts me to remember how I got into the world of, of higher education, especially theological education. And I got recruited for a job at the seminary where I'm now an administrator. It was a staff position that was working with admissions and marketing. And, um, and that was my introduction. I was a young woman. I was doing this kind of office work and ended up being an administrative assistant to the then dean, the academic dean. And one of the perks of the job was free tuition. And there was a point at which they wanted to hire a grad to direct the admissions program. And I sort of, well, I could become a grad um, if, you know, I was already doing the job. Yeah. And so, so I, I started working on my master's degree. And at the seminary, I had free tuition. Like, what's not to like about that? <laughs> and in the process of that, I was, by that time, in my early 30s, and I was thinking about how do I want to live my life in meaningful ways? And um, I was living in this academic environment, and I, you know, I, the, the flow of work and the engagement with students, and I, I began to develop an imagination for what that life might look like for me. And so, um, so I was working at maintaining my grade point average that I might have a shot at a graduate program. And finished my master's and applied to PhD programs and, and got accepted and given some money. And so haired off to Vanderbilt University in the early 1990s and started a program in church history. And um, church history, because I've always been rather fascinated by how things come to be. And the stories and the way the way things develop, and um, was particularly because I was um, was raised and nurtured in my faith in an Anabaptist community with very particular stories of heritage and immigration stories, was quite interested in in how how that immigrant experience, yeah, what does it mean to be Christian in this American environment? So that was sort of one of the early presenting questions, was interested in this North American religious history world. And um, yeah. so, so and you, you teach a class, I'm sorry to in interrupt. Area. Um, yeah, no, that's and fine. You, you teach a class devoted to that, right? Your North American, uh, or have taught a class at least in that area. Yeah, I have. Right, right now, my administrative load um, means I don't teach teach as much. But yeah, that's sort of been one of my interests and sweet spots has been that North American religious experience, hmm. and um, 
Yeah, so that's part of it. But also theology, right? Because I, I work at a small school and, and faculty wear lots of hats. And, and the lovely thing about that is you get to pursue, um, yeah, a more diverse range of subjects. So mm-hmm. throughout my teaching career, I have taught both theology and church history. Yeah, yeah. I know that. The other. Oh, I, I was going to say, and that, yeah, I mean. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think we're on, by the way, it's no big deal. I think we're on a slight delay between the two of us, probably. And so we're like, we're interjecting right before <laughs> we start talking. And so people people are going to be fine with it. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, and I, I was just going to say, and that's, so when I was at the seminary, um, that's exactly what mm-hmm. my experience would have been of you. You were uh, very much teaching theology courses and um, history courses and, um, those have been uh, kind of, if I understand it right, sort of your your two big niches um, over the years. And yeah, please keep going. Well, what I was going to say is what I have grown to realize is that what I'm really interested in is the way people make sense of things and this um, this desire we have to make meaning. And as a historian, of course, what historians are doing are researching and looking at sources and and in some way trying to tell a narrative and a story, but to give meaning to events. Um, it's not just that one thing happened after another, but there were forces at work and there were movements that happened. And, and here's how this unfolds and here's a way to understand it. And I have friends understand that that's what draws me to theological reflection as well, is that the theology is a meaning-making exercise as well. How do I understand God at work in my world, in my community, in my life? And and so the intersection for me is this notion of um, this reality that we're meaning-making creatures, and um, we won't talk about it today, but you'll recall that I have an interest in memoirs, especially spiritual memoirs. And again, yeah. it's that narrating of experience and reflecting on on one's own personal history and and this this effort to this attempt to construct and make meaning out of what has been. So anyway, that's that's what I do in my spare time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's quite I mean, quite the journey, right? To go from um staff to administrative staff uh to PhDs and everywhere. It's just so fascinating. And I love I just I've heard your story many times, but I always love hearing that journey. Um, because it's um I, I don't know what the word is, unconventional or just you know, you didn't come out of Yes, it is. Yeah, you didn't come out of the university system and say to yourself, I'm going to devote myself to scholarship and I'm going to do these things. You know, you, you said you, you saw an yeah. opportunity and a passion arise and, and you took initiative as that happened. I mean, that's a pretty cool, a pretty cool thing. Yeah, it is. It's been, um, I've, I've, yeah, it's been a good career for me. I've enjoyed the rhythms. I like working in, um, in institutional settings, if you will, uh, where you're working with people who have, diverse jobs and are working as part of a larger, larger system. I like the rhythms of of academic years and um, I have been very fortunate. So not a lot of complaints on, on that front today. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that's really neat. And I'm going to, I'm going to just share a, a short anecdote um, because you brought up spiritual <laughs> memoirs, which for me was a special mm-hmm. class. You, I, I, I think I was your first in the first cohort of that class or the first class maybe that you taught there on the Could topic. Be. I don't remember which one. Yeah. 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 But it's early. I know it was a newer class and I, I mm-hmm. loved it. I mean, for me, that was, that's towards the end of my seminary career. And, um, you know, that was 2011. And I remember, <laughs> I remember the end of that class, you had us all over for, supper, I believe it was. And we had this great discussion mm-hmm. and, and I'm leaving. And here's a couple of things. First of all, the whole meaning making thing. And you, you had this phrase we talked about, like the I then and the I now and how like in memoir, we are always making uh-huh. meaning out of our past and constructing narrative from 
what we perceive history to be and how, how that shapes us. And, and, uh, that really, I mean, set me off on a trajectory in my own writing in a lot of ways. And what, what's really cool about that and cool is going to be relative, but what's an interesting connection to all of that <laughs> is that's also, as I was leaving, I got the news that Osama bin Laden had been killed. Um, I know weird uh-huh. way to go about a story. Um, and mm-hmm. That night, I wrote a reflection on that experience. Uh, you know, like why why are people so happy about the death of a human? And I wrote this little little blog that basically like set off a chain of events that led to me having opportunities to do writing. And um, and so I, I actually look back at that class as a space that really helped mm. form a lot of that early. Um, reflective interest in some of the stuff that I, I came to write and have come to write. And now as I continue and, you know, just did this book thing, um, yeah. I was thinking about that a lot, the meaning making, because, uh, um, you know, my, it's loaded with a lot of early childhood stories about some painful stuff mm-hmm. and trying to say, okay, how much, how am I interpreting this? And what does interpretation do to how I tell the story? And I mean, I was using a lot of mm-hmm. those tools. So, so I just have to say that, um, that particular class, along with several of the other ones, has really shaped, uh, a big part of my journey. And, um, so I'm grateful for that. And so I just had to kind of bring up that anecdotally before we get into your current book and say, um, yeah, I really appreciated that about, um, that class that you brought up. Uh, thank you, Kurt. I, that's delightful. I mean, part of what becomes so gratifying to faculty and what we don't always get to hear is how something that we've loved or shaped or a passion of ours um, takes root in somebody else and, and helps set a direction. And so to know that I had any small part in contributing to, to that passion and development of a career that's blossoming for you, that's delightful to hear and and extends, yeah. That's delightful. Thank oh, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And, you know, so when I when I saw that you had come out with this book, I was just thrilled because um, I know that, number one, the content, why do we suffer and where is God when we do, it, it matters on so many levels. It's possibly one of the most central questions that anyone who seeks to understand God or be a Christian ask at some point in their lives. And, um, you know, when you talk about sort of that meaning making sort of reflection, I mean, it's, it's, this is one of those spaces where, where we do that. And Mm -hmm. so I, I think little nuggets of that kind of pop through in how you present the material at times. And, so I, I'm curious as we step into the book, um, what, uh, what really prompted you and this, and, and this topic particularly, what, what do you feel like uh, mm-hmm. brought you into conversation with one of the hardest questions, I think, to reflect on? Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things. Let's see if I can tease them out and, and make sense of them. Um, one is a, a sort of per, is the personal experience of of having to deal with loss in my own life. Some of it related to illness and the impact of of illness in the circles around me, um, friends and family members, and and how you make sense of that. And in when I was in graduate school, yeah, when I was in my doctoral program at Vanderbilt, I was diagnosed with cancer. And um, here you have to imagine me in a in a Vanderbilt Medical Center hospital room, mm-hmm. and because I I had so many connections to communities, um, my se- I had just been hired at the seminary. I had a hometown church. I happened to be serving on a board, a denominational board at the time. I have relatives in Washington and relatives in California, and so I'm in this hospital room that is full of flowers. I mean, the whole, hmm. the whole back wall against the windows has these flower arrangements. And I, I, I look awful, right? I've been sick. I've had surgery and people would walk into the room and they would say, who are you? Hmm. Like I was some famous, you know, country music star or something that wow. they just weren't recognizing. Um, but as a part of that was this influx of cards, um, get well 
cards and um and I was so struck by by the meaning making that other people were in a sense imposing on this deeply personal experience I was having in which I'd had major surgery and body parts cut out of me. Sorry, yeah. that's far too much information. Uh, no, but, it's, um, it's real. As, as cancer survivors start getting that way. Hmm. Um, and was about to head into an extended period, you know, uh, six months of, well, not six months, three months, four months of chemotherapy. And, 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 and to realize that, that people were trying to make sense of this. Here was this relatively young adult that was having this difficult experience and, and why was God doing this? And so as I, you know, it, it just struck me that that they couldn't make meaning for me. They could offer me ways of understanding, but some of it felt really false, right? Like I I didn't think that God had somehow given me cancer so that the seminary community would have really good prayer meetings. Um, Mm. Like like there must be other ways to have good prayer meetings without somebody being sick. Yeah. Um, And, and so, so, and again, I mean, that's just one out of a variety of these kinds of cards that I get that people would tell me how God was at work in this. Hmm. So, that began to shape my own thinking. How did I understand what had happened to me? You know, had had God done this to me? Was this in God's control? Um, you know, so, as I began to make sense with this personal encounter, which you know, was not the loss of my entire family, not the loss of my household, was, was you know, deeply rooted in an episode of illness. That, that started my own more tangible personal reflection on it. And then as I moved into the classroom, for many years I had an assignment and, and an essay in which I asked students to reflect. And so it was a theological essay that they had to write. And I I began to encounter students who were making, trying to make sense of really difficult experiences in their own lives. Um, I I think I, I, um, I don't tell the story in the book, but I had a student who had lost his father as a, as a teenager and, and he, he had come to terms with this deep loss by, by saying that, well, God had known that the only way this person would would really be reconciled to God and turn his life over to God was through the loss of his father. And I found myself thinking, God killed your father so you'd be saved. Hmm. That that felt a little that that didn't <laughs> that yeah. didn't seem right. Um, um, and but again, I could recognize how how do you come to terms with this God that you are invited to love and to worship, but who didn't prevent your father from dying. Um, and so, so this instinct to give it a good reason that that it had in some ways it had worked for this good. Um, that watching students wrestle with this question, I think, prompted me on this journey as well. And then finally, um, I tend to think that especially within the evangelical community, we don't take the problem um, of evil and in connection to God seriously enough, which sounds sort of funny because we're very quick to point to sin and to identify what we think is sin or evil. But I, I find in our own conversations, we're often quick to um, dismiss evil and, and we're tempted to turn it into good in the same way this young man mm-hmm. was turning in this, you know, this deeply personal loss of his father into something good that that we want to quickly turn what's bad into good. And I think we don't always slow down enough to grieve and to say, this is wrong. <laughs> yeah. this, this hurts. Mm-hmm. To, to, you know, I, I, maybe it's the pastor Im- impulse. And so to swing this back around to me in a Vanderbilt Medical Center hospital bed, yeah, I got you know stacks and stacks of cards back in the day when you sent get well cards, um, and you know there are there were lovely Helen Steiner Rice poems. Um, you're too young to know those, but but <laughs> poems with these you know, 
you know, these cards with these poems and yeah. and lots of lots of warm greetings. And then I opened a card and I don't remember the whole text, but it had something to do with ah, here we're in the hospital or this has happened. And and the inside, well, this stinks. And I thought, yes, finally, somebody yeah. said this stinks. This huh. is a dreadful thing that has happened to me. Hmm. Um I I am sick, and somebody has has said this is awful. Instead of oh, this is an opportunity to grow your character, or you know we're being united in prayer, or you know the devil's out to get women in ministry. Um, mm-hmm. Like no, here was somebody who just stopped for a moment and said, this is a bad thing. I'm sorry, this bad thing exists, and. Yeah. Um, I, I think for us as Christians that sometimes we need to say, yeah, this is a bad thing. This this is evil. This hurts. This isn't good. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I mean, in different ways, in different contexts, those are the kinds of responses I've heard a lot, too. There, we, we definitely, I want to say we with some generosity because it's not everyone, but yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right? generically speaking, there's this impulse, it feels like in at least American Christianity to reframe, you know, to, to constantly mm-hmm. look at suffering and say, but there's purpose, but there's good here. There has to be purpose. And, and yeah, I, I, um, I have a, I have a natural inclination towards that. I mean, that's part of my personality is I want to reframe things. I want to see the good and, and there's, there's good in seeing good as long as we don't deny the bad. And it seems like a big part of, um, your card experience and, and then your teaching experiences really bore out that folks don't all don't often step into their pain. And when they do, Sometimes they assign blame to God just for some, you know, mechanistic spiritual outcome that they think had to have been God or something. And um, that's that's really fascinating. And so so in a sense, you you start wrestling with this. I mean, you're wrapping up a Ph.D. and you're in Vanderbilt Hospital and here you are in the middle of this. You you bring that experience to teaching and to the questions you're asking and obviously all the way to this book. Um, that's a, yeah, that's, that's a really profound, profound, uh, process that you've kind of walked through. And, and as you, as you've done that, some of the questions of course, keep coming up, like, where does this thing called suffering come from? And, you know, why, why is there suffering at all? I know that's one of the questions you, you invite readers to consider and reflect on. And I'd love to hear some of the thoughts that um, kind of you turned around in, in this book as you were trying to help help folks answer that question. Uh, again, part of this is rooted in that, that experience with my own encounter with a, with a serious illness. Um, was as I began to do that work, and again, I'll talk about a luxury, right? So I had just spent several years doing my coursework. I was um, was had just passed my exams. Was beginning to think about dissertation, and and so I I had this sort of wide array of resources at my hand, and and you know this sort of testing of my own ideas. Did I think God had said this? Was I being punished? Was was yeah? Was there meaning in this? And what I, in that moment and over the years, have grown to realize is that 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 I'm deeply rooted in the Genesis story in terms of my own understanding of the biblical account that um, that the story of the fall says something really important about the world we live in. Both the first the creation narrative in Genesis one and two that that what God is creating is good. But then this idea that sin enters the world and disrupts things. Hmm. And if we believe that, we certainly preach it, but if we believe it, then we have to admit that we are open to sin's disruption 
and distortions in the same way everybody else is. Um, that, that just because we're, we're God followers, Jesus followers, doesn't mean that the same disruptive forces may not spill over into our lives, that, that bodies and genes mutate, right? Um, that, that people develop genetic illnesses or, or, you know, that we can't control all of the, all of the things outside of us that may impact us. Our neighbor's decision to not trim their tree and the tree falls on your house. I mean, you can't control that unless you're out in the middle of the night flying down your neighbor's tree. Hmm. Um, I mean that's a minor example. I, I hopefully <laughs> don't get lost in my no. my, my little examples. I really the larger ones. Um, so my point being that that I think if we take Genesis seriously, then then we have to see that notion that sin is sin abounds and it disrupts and this distorts things. Um, you bump into the New Testament. And now we're getting into your 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 area. Kurt, um, when we start also talking about principalities and powers, right? Mm. Um, we're subject to those forces as well, whether they are political or economic, um, that that all things are just not in our control. And so, so we suffer yeah. um, from physical ailments to, to the results of economic decisions that, that you know, keep us from feeding our families in the way that we would want to. So, so yeah, I, I'm, I call myself a Genesis girl. I'm not young anymore, but, um, but to say, yeah, I kind of take that story seriously and it helps me understand sin as a force, as a presence, if you will, as something that is disrupting God's good order. And then I always want to balance that with, but I, I want to affirm the promise of God that that God is going to reorder that chaos. Yeah. Um, and that um, that this notion of shalom isn't just an ideal, but is the end to which God is working. Yeah. Wow. That's such a good framework. And yeah, the reordering of chaos. I mean, that, that has to be our hope because um, mm-hmm. 2020 has reminded folks who have it pretty good in the world that things are not predictable and things are not easy. And um, yeah, wow. What a, what a helpful frame. And, and yeah, as you, as you continue in the book, I mean, there's several really good themes and I, um, I'm going to just, you know, we don't want to give everyone every word of your book. We're not having a reading <laughs> session here. But I mean, as you're, you're sitting with that and, and you know, if we were to go go even another step towards theology for a moment and thinking about, I mean, there's sure. a lot of options out there for how we reconcile this mm-hmm. stuff, you know, and and as Christians and, and my posture, you know, I have my opinions and you kind of know a lot of those opinions because you've seen papers or just know me. <laughs> but but, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> I, I, you know, I want to I want to have a generous uh, posture towards sisters and brothers and Jesus that have differing views yet. There are some views that maybe have a little more traction for folks, um, depending on where they're coming from. And so I'm curious, what, what, are, what are some of the views that you talk, talk about and mention in your book? And how, how have those kind of helped form sort of your own thinking on the problem of evil as you've um, kind of encountered it in, in your life, but also specifically in the text of the book? Sure. Um- I think one of the questions that, that are issues, topics that emerges when you start digging into this conversation or this topic of suffering and theodicy, and theodicy is just a fancy theological word for the problem of suffering. How do we understand God in relationship to evil, um, sin and evil? But um, but is is this notion of of um, God's control, and that is deeply rooted in our Christian tradition. We're not the first ones to wrestle with that. And is God's control the kind of um, predestination that everything is laid out? And within the Reformed tradition, historically, there's been much more um, weight given to to everything in God's control. And in fact, 
people from outside the Reformed tradition, often what we say is, well, God is in control. And, you know, in the classroom, I want to push students, like, what do you mean by control? Does that mean every decision is decided or that God is working towards a larger aim? So so that question um, has been answered in lots of ways within the Christian tradition. Um, there's a whole 17th, 18th century deistic movement in which you very much have this idea, sort of a scientific watchmaker notion that, you know, that God has has constructed this world and the universe and set the laws in place and kind of thrown it out into to time and space and and is watching it, if you will. It's just moving along and it's 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 yeah, it's ticking, if you will. Yeah. Um, not that God is intimately involved in intervening in it, but there's a kind of a spectrum from that sort of hands-off approach to a very, um, yeah, to a very intimately involved approach in which nothing happens outside of of God's desire and God's will. Um, and so then, then you, I mean, the 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 problem for me is if you go all the way to that end of the spectrum that nothing happens that isn't God's direct will, is that you're back saying that my disease, my cancer, my child's untimely death in a car accident, my, you know, creek fire, I'm living in Central California, we've got wildfires all around mm. us at this recording, um, you know, that the, the loss of my house is God's will for a greater good. I mean, I'm just not quite willing to go there, but I'm not willing to give up God's intimate involvement in our lives, in, in our work. I guess I want to have it all. I don't want to yeah. blame God for everything, but I do want God active. and hmm. I, I want to give God the good stuff and just not blame him for the bad stuff. Um, that probably hmm. won't work. <laughs> so deism, <laughs> yeah, I just can't have it all. Um, deism, <laughs> Theism is one option, um, direct control another, but in the middle of those things are, are also ways to understand that God is working towards an aim, towards a goal, is infinitely capable of bringing us to, uh, to the kingdom, right? To the eschaton, to the, to the, to the merger and recreation of all things, but that God has also uh, yeah, in 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 God's own vision for the world, has imbued humanity with choice, um, and that once you do that, God has in some ways put some limits on God's own self and being that makes um, you know that 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 means that I don't know that we have control over our lives. I'm not trying to give us a false sense that we're in charge of everything, but that but that if you will, that we're in partnership with God in, in the unfolding of our lives. Um, yeah. 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 I'm thinking that out loud and whether or not that made sense in the way I articulated it. Um, yeah. That, that God has in some ways limited um, God's own self, not that God is limited. And here now we're playing with language and nuances, mm -hmm. but that God chooses to, um, to share to share choice um, with us, and that decision has has a yeah has has shaped the world we live in and the ongoing playing out of our lives. I don't know that that's an entirely satisfactory answer, um, and it's it's one of the places where I continue to wrestle as well. Yeah, yeah, no, and you, I was tracking with you. I think you're you're making great sense that. Yeah, that idea of partnership language, that, that the world is, uh, that God experiences the good and the bad in the world with us and invites us to, um, you know, walk walk those beautiful things and those hard things with, with God. I mean, there's, um, yeah, there's something of intimacy without uh, meticulous control that kind of comes together there. And, um, you know, some... Some might see that in the Arminian tradition, the the uh, open future mm -hmm. tradition. There's kind of a, a you know some of that free will stuff, and yeah, that that makes that makes a lot of sense actually. And 
it, it for me, like both as a pastor and just as a person who has suffered and many, most people have suffered at some level, we think, um, you know, th those are the spaces where um, I find deep meaning for, for my pain, not you know, not that God caused it because God needed some outcome, but that in the midst of it, there's a God who cares enough to step into it with me. Um, that, that's a, that's a story that, um, you know, doesn't take away pain as much as it frames sort of how, how we relate to God in the midst of it. And that, that to me seems really relevant. And you, you, you take this on a little bit. You actually have a section on pain and prayer that I remember. And I, I'm going to quote you here really quick. Um, you say in mm -hmm. one spot, you say in prayer, we remember that God suffers with us through love for creation and in the experience of Jesus's suffering on the cross. So, so if you think about these themes and, and how prayer fits into this picture, um, Talk, talk us through that is, um, you know, a couple of questions sure. might come to mind, of course, about the nature, how, how does God suffer? I mean, there's a lot of stuff we could ask about, but specifically prayer and God's fidelity uh, with us. What does that all sort of look like? I think people wrestle with the notion of prayer in relationship to suffering, both because I, I think our instinct is to say, God, remove it. And of course we do that. And none of us wants, none of us enjoys, well, if we're, if we're healthy in any way, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're not looking to suffer. We're not looking for pain. And so that sort of instinctive, God, heal me, God, remove this barrier, God, take away this thing that's causing us so much distress. Um, I, I, I think that's a natural reaction. But what I think sometimes Christians are prone to do is is search for the right way to pray, pray that the prayer that will work to alleviate or to resolve a problem. If we only have enough people praying, if we only pray in this way, if if this is the pattern that we pray, I ain't no we're not doing incantations. Um, right. You know, we, we don't need to get the spell right in order to <laughs> solve the problem. Um, this is prayer, not magic. Um, yeah. And and so as I have wrestled with that, then to think about what does prayer in the midst of suffering do? How does prayer sustain me as it builds a relationship with God and helps me acknowledge God's presence? How do I pray when God... God just seems so distant and unresponsive to what I'm suffering, and um, and whether that's yeah, and suffering ranges, mental illness and distress, physical suffering, not only illness but but because of food deprivation or because of um, I don't know if we start thinking globally and economic oppression and political oppression and people who are imprisoned and I mean uh, there are all sorts of ways that people suffer. Um, so how does prayer remind me that I'm in relationship with God and how does prayer begin to to shape my own ability to withstand suffering, to um, take the actions to relieve it. How does prayer help spur me towards relieving the suffering of others as I am able? So, so for me, that piece on prayer um, is something that I'm still wrestling with. But this notion that it 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 can shape my affirmation of God's presence and can can spur me on even to activity. Um, I, I guess. What what I want for people is is to say, oh, suffering doesn't mean God isn't there, or doesn't exist. Suffering is a means through which I learn something new about God and potentially about the community of God's people. And here, you know, the Anabaptist part of me says, yeah, the community matters, mm, um, both yeah. in our action to alleviate suffering, but also that if I fly as I suffer, that I am in the midst of God's people who may also be suffering or who have suffered historically. Um, 
So, so they're one of the tie-ins, of course, in, in the Anabaptist Mennonite tradition, the 16th century Radical Reformation was a period in which there was lots of persecution and martyrdom. Um, do I find, you know, do I find models for perseverance and faithfulness in those stories so that I am, even in that sense, connected to the community of God's people who have sought to be faithful in the midst of suffering? Um, Wow. Wow. Boy, that's I love a whole that. lot easier to preach, though. But it's a whole lot easier to preach, Kurt, than it is to live. Mm-hmm. Um, if if I am dealing with, yeah, the diagnosis of, yeah, of, of, a, of a really difficult, yeah, terminal illness and somebody I love to say, this is going to allow me to to suffer. <laughs> this is gonna, I'm going to learn something about suffering. I, none of us says, oh, good. Um, yeah. Even though in the course of that, there may be some deeply meaningful growth that happened. Um, and I think that's also, that's also part of the balance for this. But, but prayer is work. Um, I, I don't think it's just a matter of getting our prayers right. Hmm. Wow. Wow. I mean, one of the things that you bring to mind is, uh, I mean, in, in one sense, it's kind of like, you know, God doesn't necessarily cause suffering directly, but something about the goodness of God actually takes anything possible without coercing us from that pain t- to relate to us in a different kind of way. Almost, it's it's kind of a a weird. I don't know. That's that's one thing I've been thinking about. Is you know, on the one hand, God doesn't at least how I understand and how I hear you describing, you know, God doesn't necessarily look around and say, well, today, you know, Kurt needs to learn about long suffering, (laughs) you know, and push a button. And now I have (laughs) boils on my skin or something. And I I suddenly look up for the first time and say, oh, God, who gives me these boils? I want to know you deeply through these Mm -hmm. boils. But there's this other sense that God sees that grieves with me in my, you know, painful state and says, I'm Mm -hmm. going to be there for you. I want you to experience me through this and maybe even might show me some of my own personal blind spots that, um, you know, suffering can draw out, but, but there's something deeply relational and responsive about it rather than sort of inflict and then comfort. I don't know. There, there's, those are two narratives that I've heard so much. And, and I, I don't know, I'm, yeah. the more I sit with it, it's like, ah, it's gotta be this relational response and tilting of something that is evil for good, you know? Um, yeah. So I'm hearing a lot of those yeah. themes. What do you think there? Well, as, as you're talking, uh, part of what I'm reminded of is that that in suffering, we are also connected to what it means to be human. Um, our our bodies are marvelous, right? Resilient yeah. and strong and can accomplish world record racing to enormous feats of brain power and invention and innovation, um, creativity. But they're also fragile, right? They They won't last forever. Um, we age and we encounter. And so part of what physical suffering now, physical and emotional suffering has to do with is also is experiencing what it means to be human. And I guess here I'm going to go back to Genesis and think, yeah, this is why for me the Genesis story is so useful. Um, it talks about this disruptive influence. And this is why the Christian um, affirmation of, yeah, that Jesus is coming again, that there is um, a hope for resolution offers offers this vision of something being made right. But in the meantime, yeah, all of us are going to suffer at some, I mean, it's not very many of us who will live really, um, you know, really comfortable lives and, you know, die gently in our beds. Um, right. Yeah. Most of us at some point are going to have some element of suffering. And to remember that that if God truly cares about this creation, then everything from climate change to, uh, to the toxicity of major rivers, um, you know, that, that God cares about this creation, created it out of 
you know, out of love and, and this overflow of creativity and design that surely God cares about this world. And um, the biblical claim is that God loves us, <laughs> that God is calling a people together mm. to be God's own people, um, to join God in this this mission of yeah, of reconciliation, of shalom building, even now. Again, it preaches easier than it is to live it. So lest anybody listening thinks that I have got this all weighed out in my own practices, um, I, I'm mindful that <laughs> that it preaches um, the challenge is always to live it out in our own in our own lives. Yeah. Wow. And no, I appreciate that. I think. Um... That's that's down to earth and real because anytime we start talking about, you know, we can, as as a writer, you can you can write about ideas <laughs> that make sense, and then you can apply them, and and it's we're we're all going to have to figure out how to actually apply these things, and so I, I appreciate that, and and you know, as we kind of wrap up here, I'm curious. Um, do you know, if you would have a few words, it's related to what you just said, but the invitation, what's the invitation mm -hmm. as we, we as followers of Jesus, I mean, you've mentioned the Christian community and our shared uh, narratives for, for you and I and the Anabaptist tradition and, and mm -hmm. uh, throughout the world, uh, we see suffering. So as Jesus people, what, what does it look like to move forward? Ah, thanks for that invitation. Um, I think one thing is to understand and and affirm this notion that God suffers as well, that in the death of God's dearly beloved son, God knows what it is to experience loss mm. and and both the human experience of pain and rejection. Um, I mean, this is what's so important about the incarnation, right? God with us, God fully understanding this human experience, which is subject subject to sin and evil, right? To the brokenness of the world. So that God gets it, right? That God gets it. Mm. Um, and that that on a good day offers comfort, right? That that God gets this even if it isn't all alleviated, that as I pour out and explain it to God one more time why whatever's happening to me is bad, that God gets it. Um, the other thing I think then is is to 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 sort out how do I live with suffering? Um, is this going to hone my character? Is this going to propel me towards God and more into relationship, into following Jesus? Or is my choice to say, yeah, this God stuff is all fiction? Or if this is if this is what it means to live, then I don't need this God who won't alleviate my suffering. And so I think any of us who claim to be Christian, that choice of whether suffering takes me deeper into the tradition or whether it it offers me an excuse to walk away, that's a personal wrestling. And then if we stay in the tradition, if we continue to use um the, the Christian narrative is a way to frame and understand our own experiences, then um, as I live with suffering or or am not suffering, am I attentive to the suffering around me? So in the same way, God's love for creation and for people engages God with us, do I develop compassion for others? Does it matter to me that other people are oppressed? Does it matter to me that my neighbor is ill. Am I, am I in, you know, as I am able in my purview, am I working to alleviate suffering and to stem the tide of evil in, in my own context or whether I am saying, oh, well, too bad. It's all going, you know, it's all going south anyway, and there's nothing I can do to stop it. And I think, I think Jesus followers <laughs> are called to, to enter into that world and to join that work of God in yeah justice and reconciliation as we're able. 
Yes. Wow. What a what a great picture of the invitation and uh, what a fun conversation this has been. I, I'm really just grateful for you and the the book again for folks who are listening is called Why Do We Suffer and Where Is God When We Do by Valerie G. Rempel and. Valerie, as we go, um, by the way, sometimes, sometimes folks who, um, <laughs> hear me call you Valerie might think, is he so casual with her? Like what's up? Uh, that, that's how we would talk in the <laughs> classroom environment, actually at, at our school. It was, it was never professor Rempel or whatever. And so someone might be hearing this, like, why is he so casual? She has a PhD. I know. Trust me. I know. Um, but, but all that aside, um, you know, the book is great. It's, I I think I'm looking at the outline again, and I just think to myself, you know, if you're if you're a pastor, here's four or five uh, weeks of sermon topics that your book will really give some grounding in. I think if uh, someone's just following Jesus and wanting to wrestle with a very important topic, this book does that too for them. And so um, I'm really excited about the book and uh, thought I'd give you a chance as far as um, some of the ongoing work you're doing in um, seminary education. Uh, Some folks may not know, but the program that you lead or the, I mean, the seminary that you help lead, I should say, is... um, thoroughly online as everywhere is during COVID, but you actually have a very (laughs) niche program that um, has uh, kind of a a really cool opportunity for folks who are wanting to do seminary, but, you know, to move would be a big deal. Um, Yeah. Say anything you want about some of the opportunities for folks that might want to connect with some of the work you do in the seminary context. Oh, terrific. An invitation to offer a commercial. Um, we have a, an online cohort model, master's degree, 48 units in ministry, leadership, and culture, which is particularly for people who are embedded in ministry, who in ways get credit for the work they are doing, but then along the way are honing their skills in, um, in the Bible, in theological reflection, in a whole set of practical ministry skills that are particularly paying attention to how to to understand the cultural context in which they're embedded, um, hence ministry, leadership, and culture. So how do we lead our nonprofit organizations and our pastoral assignments, um, staff assignments? And so that ministry, leadership, and culture degree has, um, as I think the feedback we get from students has really shaped their lives in ministry. So it develops the cohort, and that's terrific. Um, seminary, of course, offers... Um, yeah, other programs that are traditional, MDiv, et cetera. And then we have a very strong program in marriage and family therapy that's not fully online. It requires relocation, but um, is turning out counselors and um, therapists who are really adept at helping um, yeah, people towards healing and hope and wellness in that therapeutic world as well. So... So, and then, of course, we have the traditional MDiv and things like that and MA theology programs, et cetera. But, um, but for the online environment, our MLC programs, check us out, Fresno Pacific Biblical Seminary, um, terrific resource people, and an affordable cohort model program. How's that for a commercial? That that Thanks, was sir. good. That was good. Yes, yes. And I, <laughs> um, you know, having been a part of that world, I definitely think, huh, it should give the commercial. I like the program. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan. Well, hey, I, I just want to thank you for your time and for a great chance to catch up and chat a little bit. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing more about future projects and also um, seeing how this book really helps a lot of people. I'm sure it's going to. So thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you, Kurt, for the invitation. It's been such a pleasure to visit and to, to talk about these things together. Thanks for listening to Theology Curator. For more resources from Kurt Willems, check out theologycurator.com forward slash newsletter to sign up for our email update list. For new listeners of the podcast, we hope you will subscribe via iTunes, Google, or your podcast manager of choice. If you like what you hear, please leave the show a review. 
For regular listeners, consider supporting Kurt's online ministry at patreon.com forward slash Kurt Willems. Lastly, please don't let this conversation end when the episode is over. We hope you feel empowered in regular life to explore theology and faith in intelligent and humanizing ways.